Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to see you all here. And the lovely snow. Welcome to all of you who are watching. Um, you would stand with us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this day. We thank you for keeping us all safe. We thank you for traveling mercies here and throughout the week. We thank you for this season, the season that um, starts the process of the whole reading of the cross. So we thank you for that. We thank you for um, the love that you extend to us each and every day. We thank you for our families. We just thank you. We're just grateful today. We ask that you would be with us today in the service and that our worship will be pleasing to you. Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
God. Good morning. Good morning. Good to be here. I'm glad to see you guys uh, brave the snow as well as the pandemic. It's, it's really hard to preach to an empty room. I have to say that. So I'm glad a few of you are here, so I can uh, I can see your faces while uh, while I'm preaching. So it uh, looks like we got a white Christmas a little early. <laughs> Uh, so, I, look, I love the snow until I got to get in the car and start driving. Yes, Lord. And yeah, then, yeah, yeah. 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 That's right. then I don't really like the snow anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Looks beautiful on postcards, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. But when you're out there having to drive in it, it's, it's not so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, you know, just be safe, you know, when it's snowing really? out there. Always, we always hear about uh, accidents and, and just multi-car pileups on the highway. And I always think to myself, what are you people doing on the highway? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, when, when the weather calls for, for that kind of snow, I, I, you know, my wife and I are like, hey, there's no place in the world that we have to be that's so important. Right. You know? So, anyway. Uh, I'm glad, you know, I just hope you guys are safe. Everyone watching on Facebook, I hope you guys are being safe uh, during this uh, pandemic. And now we add uh, winter in Northeast Pennsylvania. I guess this is Central Pennsylvania. Um, so uh, just be safe and be smart. You know? um, but as we, you know, as we do come closer to Christmas, you know, it is nice. Uh, I've always told my wife that, you know, people in the South don't celebrate Christmas. <coughs> Because you can't have Christmas without snow. I mean, it, you know, Bing Crosby saying white Christmas, not sunny Christmas. <laughs> so my wife grew up in El Salvador, and I told her, you didn't celebrate Christmas in El Salvador. <laughs> so she insists that they did. I just, you know, I doubt it. I'm sorry. You know, she loves, I told you guys, she loves watching those Hallmark movies, right? Yeah. Uh, the Christmas yeah. Hallmark movies. And I always point out to her that sometime during the movie, no matter where the movie's set, you are going to see snow. <laughs> well, I said, even homework knows you can't have Christmas without snow. <laughs> so, praise God. I, I absolutely love the Christmas season. I, I love uh, Christmas in, in the northern part of the country because it's just, it, it is kind of what you picture when you, when you talk about Christmas. All the Christmas cards you see, you know, it's, it's all about the, uh, the beautiful winter weather. Uh, so if you you know if you're a, a skier or you love uh, snow sports, uh, this is this is your time of year. Um, but we are going to continue our series now as I, I get just a tiny bit more serious. Uh, as we get closer to the Christmas season, uh, we're going to be we're going to continue talking about the characters of the Christmas season. And today I want to talk about somebody we really don't talk about that much, and it is Simeon. And we find Simeon's story in Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 35. Now, a quick note uh, about Luke. Some of you may not know this. Uh, Luke uh, was not uh, an eyewitness to, to the events that he outlines in his, in his letter. His letter, if you look at the beginning of the book of Luke, his letter is written to a person by the name of Theopolis. And Luke also wrote Acts. Acts would be, you know, uh, Luke 2 basically, the continuation of the story. Uh, and again, he's writing to Theophilus. We believe Theophilus was a Roman official, and he commissioned Luke to investigate all the claims of this group that, you know, called Christians. And so Luke, this is why you'll find a lot of detail in, in Luke's gospel that you won't find in the other gospels, because Luke is going beyond his own experience. He is going, he's interviewing people who were there. And who experienced these, these events. And he's starting with the birth of Jesus. And he talked to several people that you don't hear about in the other Gospels. Simeon being one of them. And so in Luke chapter 2 verses uh, 25 to 35. It says, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon. Who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. That he would not die because God saying, sovereign Lord. As you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel 
and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. So this is pretty much all we hear about Simeon, but I, I think you'd agree it's a, it's a pretty important piece of the puzzle. Now here's somebody who was told that you will not die until you see the Messiah come. Now I tend to believe uh, that Simeon was a little older by this time uh, because when somebody says, Lord, you may now dismiss me in peace, it's basically he's saying I can die now, I can die in peace. So I'm thinking that he's a little older. I don't think a 20 year old would say that. I think a 20 year old would be like, cool, I get to see the Messiah, right? But he's, he's saying, you know, you may now dismiss me in peace uh, because I've seen your salvation. So I, I think Simeon was probably a little bit older, maybe in his 50s, uh, because like, I said back, uh, like I've said before, back then, people did not live as long as they do now. So he was probably an old man by their standards. So based on this story, I want to make a point, and then I want to ask you a question. So the point I want to make is that God's promises never fail. Amen. Amen. So again, Simeon was promised. Now we don't know how old Simeon was when he was promised this. We don't know how long he had to wait. We don't know how old he was when the Messiah came. Like I said, I believe he was probably a little older. Uh, but I have no evidence for that. I just think that because of what he said. You may now dismiss me in peace. But, it, you know, he may have been waiting a year, he may have been waiting 10, he may have been waiting 30 years to see God's Messiah. But <clears throat> this story shows us that God's promises never fail. And I want you to know, God's timing is perfect. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm not going to develop that point uh, just yet. Next week, I want to talk a little bit more about God's perfect timing for when the Messiah came into the world. But I want you to understand that God's timing is perfect. You know, God called me to the ministry when I was 15 years old. And, uh, you know, God knows, God knew what my journey was going to look like. He knew that it would take me a while, you know, I would fall away, and it would take me a while to come back. And even after coming back, it would take me a while to get back to that point where he could renew that call in my life. But when God called me to the ministry at 15 he knew the, the, the path my life would take, and, he's, and he, set, he set me on that path when I came back to him to, to fulfill the call that he had in my life. And it was just three years ago that I became an official minister of the gospel. And I've been ministering for longer than that, but you know, I finally got my minister's card because God called me specifically to the pastorate. And I can tell you, God, timing is perfect because he... He took me through some experiences that have actually helped me in my ministry. Now, I will have to tell you, because uh, I want to be honest with you, I didn't like those experiences. <laughs> I did not like all the experiences that God gave me a choice. I would have said, no, we did skip over a couple of those things. But because God put me through some of those things, as a pastor and as a minister, I I've been able to counsel with people who have gone through those same things that I've gone through. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, the, the experience, I, I'm not going to say I wouldn't trade the experience. <clears throat> that, wouldn't, that wouldn't entirely be true. <laughs> I, I probably would trade the experiences for something else, but uh, I, I, I recognize the value of the experiences that I had, and I recognize the, the value of going through the journey that I went through before finally uh, fulfilling God's call in my life. So I want you to understand that whatever God has promised you, whatever season of life you happen to find yourself in, I want you to know God will fulfill that promise in you. Because God's promises never fail. The Bible tells us that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. God doesn't call you and then later think, oh, well, that was a mistake. <laughs> you know, God didn't call me. At 15 years old, God called me to the ministry, and he didn't, he didn't later when I, when I fell away and became the person that I became before coming back to him. He didn't think to himself, whoa, what was I thinking? 
No, God, God knows the end from the beginning. So if he's promised you something, he will bring it to fulfillment. Now, God's timing is perfect, but his timing isn't our timing. I'm sure when God promises you something, I know, you know, we're, we're very impatient. And we're getting more impatient as generations come and go. And, and you know, with social media. I mean, when I was growing up, we were called the microwave generation, right? Because we wanted everything instantly. You know, pop it in the microwave, two minutes, you've got dinner. Uh, but, you know, what do we call this, this, this new generation, you know, the social media generation, uh, where they're getting everything, you know, every second of the minute they're being bombarded with information. Yep. And, and, and it's, it is affecting, and actually scientific studies have shown, it is affecting our ability to concentrate and to focus on, on certain things on, on for <coughs> longer periods of time. So I, I know that when God promises us something, we want it right now. It's like, woo, let's go. You know, God promised me that. But God has a process. You know, when God called me to the ministry, he already had in mind the process he was going to take me through. He knew his plan included the decisions that I was going to make. See, this is the thing we don't, we don't understand about God. We always talk about uh, God's permissive will. Have you ever heard that? Mm -hmm. Most non-biblical thing I've ever heard in my life. There is no such thing as God's permissive will, folks. Now... Uh, would God prefer that Adam and Eve had never sinned? Yes, I'm sure he would have preferred that. Would God have preferred that I not fall away? Yes, I think God would have preferred that I not fall away and I would have followed a different path. But when God laid out his plan, he took that into account. God knew that was going to happen. When Adam and Eve fell, he knew they were going to fall. That's why we get the first prophecy of the Messiah right there in Genesis. So God's plan includes the decisions that you are going to make. So there's no such thing as God's permissive will because he already knew what you were going to do to begin with. Now, it would be better for us if we would simply follow uh, God's plan the way you know the way he would prefer it would have been better for me much better for me if I had simply followed God from the beginning to now it would have been a lot better for me I would have saved myself a whole lot of anguish. I would have saved myself a whole lot of anguish and I would have saved the other people a whole lot of pain but see God's plan I was not ever in God's permissive will, you know, because God's plan included all of those decisions I was going to make. He knew what was going to happen, and his plan went, uh, went beyond my decision making. See, that's how great God is, folks. I want you to understand this about God. God's plan doesn't just include you or me. God's plan has included every single human being that has ever lived throughout time. Don't try to think about that too much. You're going to break your brain. But, but, think, but, but I want you to think about it for just a second, though, that God's plan. See, our plans are like this, you know, laser focus right in front of us. This is, this is our plan, whatever's right here. God's plan is a lot bigger than that. Amen. It's like the difference between uh, walking up to a mural and standing three inches away from it or stepping back, you know, several feet and taking the whole thing in. See, our vision is right here. You know, this is all we get to see is that little slice, that little piece of the mural. But see, God is the one who created the entire mural. And he has the whole picture in mind from Adam and Eve all the way to the very end on Judgment Day. His plan includes every single human being on the planet at every given time. So, uh, you know, I, I understand where the idea of God's permissive will come from. It doesn't exist, folks. God, God doesn't have a permissive will. His, his plan includes every single decision that will ever be made by every single human being throughout time. That's how great God is. So if God has made you a promise, he will fulfill that promise in you. So that's the first thing. So what has God promised us? Is the question. <coughs> <clears throat> now, I don't know what God has promised you personally. In my, when I was 15, God called me to the ministry. I mean, and, and I mean official pastorate type of ministry. Now, we're all called to the ministry. We're all called to, to preach the gospel. 
But some of us are called to preach it from a pulpit. Some of us are called to preach it in our homes. Amen. But what else has God promised us? Well, number one, and the reason we celebrate Christmas in the first place, is God promises us forgiveness. That's what, that's what the Savior of the world was all about. Because guess what? We needed saving. If there's one thing that I know when I look at the world today, and when I look at the world in, in its history, if there's one thing I know is that we need a Savior. And I personally needed a Savior in my life. Because when I was, when I was making my own decisions, my life spiraled out of control. And would probably have ended with me taking my own life at some point. But when I turned my life over to God, He <clears throat> saved me. He saved my life. He saved my soul. <clears throat> he gave me purpose. God forgave all of those things that I had ever done. Jesus came so that He could save the world. He could provide forgiveness and a new start. That's what Christmas is all about. It's about a new beginning for all of us. <clears throat> 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And that's for all of you people that believe somehow that God chooses who goes to heaven and who goes to hell arbitrarily. I heard that this week. I, I, I was listening to a podcast and, and I heard a debate uh, between, uh, or actually, it wasn't a debate. Uh, somebody asked a question about predestination. Because there, there are a couple uh, verses in the Bible that talk a little bit about predestination. But if God predestines you either for heaven or for hell, then why does it say that if we confess our sins, He will forgive our sins? It doesn't say He might forgive your sins. It says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins. You know, a quick note on predestination. You know what the Bible means by predestination? Because you've got to take the Bible in its entirety. You can't just take one verse out and, and interpret it in a vacuum. You have to interpret the Bible as a whole. So if you want to talk about predestination, I think what the Bible means by predestination, and I'll give you this example. If I have a party, if I decide to have a party, and I invite all of you to my party, you are all predestined to enjoy my party because I've invited you. So every one of you is predestined to enjoy whatever I have set up at this party, but it's still your choice whether or not you attend. Mm -hmm. So I have predestined you. So those of you who do show up, in a sense, I predestined you to enjoy this party, but it's still your choice whether or not to attend. Mm -hmm. See, if, if if God chose, if if God simply mm -hmm. chose people to go to hell and <coughs> go to hell, and there's nothing you or I could do about it, what was the point of the cross? Amen. Why did Jesus have to suffer such a terrible death? To provide forgiveness. I mean, God always had the right to do that, didn't he? If, if God has the right to choose who goes to heaven and go, who goes to hell, he doesn't need the cross. He has that right from the very beginning. So, you know, I should have a, a sign that says apologetics under whenever I'm <laughs> So, if you weren't paying attention, rewind the tape and, and you know, you'll get a little apologetics in there. Um, but we're talking about forgiveness. So, yeah, I mean, if we confess our sins, that's an action on our part. Jesus, when he came to his public ministry, said, repent. Repent is a decision on my part. That's right. If God decided who goes to heaven and who goes to hell, regardless of what you do, Jesus wouldn't have said repent. He would have just said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <coughs> all right, I'm done with that. Let's move on. <laughs> I can do this all day. I really do. First Peter 2, 21 through 25 says... To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. Isaiah 118 says, Come now, let us reason 
together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they, will, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. <clears throat> God has promised you forgiveness, folks. And all we have to do is accept that forgiveness by accepting the sacrifice that Jesus came to provide. That's the Christmas story. And it's a great story. So what else has God, has, prom God, has God promised us? God has promised us peace. And I don't know about you. 2020, I could use a little peace. So God has promised us that peace, folks. Isaiah 26, 3, one of my favorite, absolute favorite verses, that will keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because they trust in you. So if you trust God, if you really trust the Lord, he will keep you in perfect peace. There is no pandemic that can take your peace away. There is no election that can take your peace away. God will keep you in perfect peace if you just put your trust in him. The reason we lose our peace is we put our trust in other things. Yeah. <clears throat> we put our trust in the government or, or in our bank account or in our jobs. And those things are never stable, folks. God is never changing. You can trust him. The God who died for you on the cross is the God who will care for you in your life. <coughs> if you give him your trust, he will give you that peace and he will keep you in that peace. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. That's what Jesus told his disciples and he tells us today. You don't have to be afraid. Now, don't be stupid, but you don't have to be afraid. <laughs> That's my thing with, with Christians sometimes. Sometimes we, we, take, we, we take faith to mean that we can do whatever we want and there are no consequences. That's not what faith is, folks. You know, as, as the Bible says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. We are going through a pandemic. I've, I've met way too many Christians who, who are walking around without taking any precautions whatsoever. Well, that's dumb. It's 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 a disease, guys. It doesn't it doesn't discriminate. It doesn't check to see if you're a child of God. That would be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> it's like the virus is about to attack. You're like, oh wait, that was a child of God. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna infect them. No, you can be infected no matter what if you're not taking precautions. Take reasonable precautions, but you don't have to be afraid. That's my point. You don't have to fear this thing. <laughs> Another promise God has given us. God promised he would never leave you. <clears throat> Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God promised that he would be with you no matter what. Even when you go through those times of depression, even when you go through those times of loneliness, when you feel like, like there's no one there who, who loves you, there will always be one who truly loves you. Now look, I would, you know, I, I want us to be the kind of church that people can come to when they feel alone. I want us to be the kind of church that embraces people and makes them, uh, makes them realize that they are part of a community. But if, if you are feeling alone, if you truly, if, if there is nothing that, that, that kind of soothes that ache in your heart, I want you to understand God has promised that he will never, ever leave you. And that includes the times when you make those mistakes. I fell away from the Lord at, at 19 years old, and yet I can tell you for those eight years of my life, I can honestly tell you, you would never have known it if you had known me at that time, you would never have known it by talking to me or looking at me or seeing what I was doing. But I can tell you God was always there. I can look back now and tell you that I felt the calling of God throughout that entire time. Never once did, did God ever abandon me. 
See, we give up on people. And, and I think it's the saddest thing in the world, especially for Christians. I think it's the saddest thing in the world when, when, when you give up on somebody. There is always hope. As long as someone is alive, there is hope. Now, they may get on your nerves. They may drive you crazy. Now, looking at your faces, you guys have somebody in mind. Right now. <laughs> Don't speak it out. But look, they may drive you crazy, but you know what? God never gave up on you. Don't give up on them. I actually heard somebody in, in one of my previous churches tell someone that they shouldn't come back to church. I wanted to, I wanted, I, I can't do it, I couldn't do it, but I wanted to slap them in the head. Amen. <laughs> How can you tell somebody that? Look, I don't care what, what's going on in their life. The church is where they should be. Amen. If we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit is welcome here, and he is in this church, then this is where they need to be. Because if they are not getting God's word, then how are they ever going to turn their life around? They should be coming to church more, not less. Now look, if you are if you're committing a sin, if you are living with somebody without the benefit of marriage, the Bible tells us that that is sinful. You can't be standing up here on the pulpit. Okay? I could not stand here if, if I had an affair. I could not stand here and preach God's word while being in violation of God's word. So there has to be, you know, there has to be like a discipline. But you never tell somebody you can't come. And, and, I can, and I can promise you that as long as I am the pastor here, you, we will never tell anybody that. Like I said, they may not be able to minister, they may not be able to be on the pulpit, but they are more than welcome to be in the, in, in the congregation. It doesn't matter what they do. And I have that perspective because I know that God never gave up on me. And, and to quote the Apostle Paul, you know, I was the worst of sinners at one time. And yet God never gave up on me. God kept calling me and calling me and calling me. And over and over and over again, he would tell me, you can come home. You can come home. And I remember hearing him say that that night in my living room, summer of, of 1997. Sitting in my living room and just, just thinking about how far I had fallen. And remembering when I knew the Lord. Just sitting there remembering all the times that I had shared with the Lord, all the times that people had prayed over me, all the times that I had felt his presence and thinking and wondering, is it even possible? Can, can I really come back? And I can tell you, in the quietness of my living room, I could hear the Lord say, yes, you can come home. So I'm telling each and every one of you here, anyone watching me on Facebook, I don't care what anybody's told you, whether it be a pastor or a minister, an evangelist, I don't care, a prophet, I don't care what anybody tells you, you can come home. Amen. Yeah. Amen. God promised he would never leave us. God promised that he would guide us. Psalms 32, 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Isaiah 30, 21 and 22. Although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, <coughs> your teachers will be hidden no more. With your own eyes you will see them. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear, will hear a voice saying, this is the way, walk in. Romans 8, 28. It says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. He promised to guide you, folks. So if you're confused about anything, if you wonder what decision you should make, go to God. And I say go to God, and I don't mean go to God with your mind made up. Because that's what most of us do. We already know what we want to do. And we go to God and say, Lord, is this okay? <laughs> no? Yeah? No? Didn't hear anything, so it must be fine. <clears throat> no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being
being honest and, and coming to God and saying, Lord, I will do your will no matter what. If this relationship is not your will, I will get out of it. Now, if you're married, that does not apply to you. <laughs> Once you're married, you are, you are committed. So, because I know there are married people watching this right now who are thinking to themselves, well, I think God told me I shouldn't be in this relationship. No. Pastor Fernando did not say that. But whatever the decision is, you know, a, a promotion at your job that may require you to work more hours. Go to God. Is that going to affect your family? Is that going to affect the ministry that God has for you? Go to God and ask him, Lord, what do I do? And wait for him to answer. Don't, don't come to him with an answer in your mind. Because that's what most of us do. We have a list of things that we want. And we think, well, because I want this, it must be God's will, right? Not necessarily. I mean, even good things. Sometimes good things uh, are not necessarily God's will at this time. Mm -hmm. Now try telling that to an engaged couple. <laughs> In one ear and out the other, I guarantee you. <laughs> but I think we, we, we would do, a, we, as a church, we would do a lot better if we counseled young people to a little patience. Yeah, yeah. They're not going to listen, but we can try. <laughs> <laughs> no offense, guys. But I was young once. <laughs> and I, I definitely didn't listen to anybody. I wish I had listened to my mother. I think back now. I, I remember the day when I called my mother and said, Mom, I should have listened to you. <laughs> my mom remembers that day, too. I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> but look, if, if whatever your age. Look, I know when you're young, especially, your, your emotions are really intense. And, and an intense attraction can seem like love at the time. I've been there. A long time ago. <laughs> but we've got to trust God. We've got to trust that God knows what's best for us. And even, even sometimes a good thing, and marriage is a good thing. I am married, have been for, for 20, going on 24 years next year. And uh, praise God. I, I thank God every day. For my wife. I thank God every day for my wife for putting up with me for, for 24 years. Uh, and so I tell you, marriage is a good thing, but, you, you know, it, it is also a very difficult It is also a very difficult thing. Uh, you know, I know we all, when you're young, you have all these romantic notions about marriage, right? Oh, we're going to grow old together. And, you know, TV doesn't help. <laughs> My wife's favorite commercials, I, I don't remember what the product was for, but there's a commercial about a couple, you know, and you see them first getting, you know, getting together, going on their first date, and then, in the, you know, they're getting married, and then they're having their first child, and then the commercial <coughs> ends with them, like, you know, on their 50th wedding anniversary or something like that. It's a beautiful picture, but there are a whole lot of things that happen in between those, those events. So, hey, look, marriage is beautiful, but it is hard. Relationships in general are hard. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pinpointing uh, that because I, I seem to, you know, it seems to me in the church, that's the thing we have the most trouble with, is, is people, you know, young people getting married just a little bit too soon. So, but whatever the issue is, whatever decision you are facing, you need to come to God with an open heart and trust that he does know what's best for you. He has promised to guide you. You've got to trust that. So if you want to know what God has not promised you, God has not promised you an easy, comfortable life. Now don't turn off the computer. <laughs> Hear me out. Look, at the, as a matter of fact, God actually promised us the exact opposite. 2 Timothy 3, 12 and 13 says, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It doesn't say might. It says will be persecuted. While evil evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. John 16, 33, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Even going back to Romans 8, 28, it says that in all things, God works for the good of those.
those who love him. It doesn't say that all things are good. You know, the Lord promised Joseph that he would rule. He gave him several dreams that even his own family would bow down to, bow down to him. What God didn't tell him was that he would be a, a slave and, and, a, and a prisoner in the, in the interim. The Lord promised Paul that he would preach in Rome. He didn't tell Paul that he would do it as a prisoner. So, whatever it is that you are going through, understand that God is not out to get you. <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, God does have a plan in your life. And he is fulfilling that plan, even when it seems like things are out of control. Now look, sometimes we suffer bad consequences because we make bad choices. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've had many a conversation with people who blame God for their situation, but really it can be traced to the choices that they make. And I can tell you the same in my own life. Every, every bad thing that has ever happened to me, I can trace to some stupid decision I made. Now, sometimes you suffer... Not because of a decision you made, but because of a decision someone else makes. Mm -hmm. But no matter what happens in your life, God may not have promised you an easy life, but he did promise you that it would be good. <clears throat> Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. This is what, uh, my daughter's favorite, uh, favorite Bible verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. That is a powerful promise. Because no matter how far away you feel like you are from God, God has promised you, you will find him. If you just seek him, if you seek him with all of your heart, he will be found by you. God's not hiding. He's not hiding from you. He's not angry with you. Look, we make mistakes, and, and God is not happy uh, when we do things that we shouldn't do, but he's not angry with you. We need to dispel the notion that somehow God will shun you because of the mistakes you've made. Now, he does call you to repentance. He calls you to stop making those mistakes, to turn around and live your life for him. But even while you are making those mistakes, God has not given up on you. God has not forgotten about you. He is ready to take you by the hand and to lift you up and to get you back on the right path. He promised you that you will find him if you seek him. It doesn't matter what you've done. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. I've hurt people. There are people in there are people that I have known in my life that, that I can I can promise you they they wish they had never known me. And I've done my best in, in these 20 years uh, since I came back to the Lord to make amends. But there are some people I can never I can never make up with. And I you know I have to trust that God will just take care of, of anything that I can't take care of. And so I seek the Lord in those situations. I said, Lord, I can't do anything about this, but you can. And God promised you, if you just seek him with all your heart, you will find him. So I made my point. Now I want to ask you a question. If God told you that Jesus would return in your lifetime, would it change how you live? Would it change some of the decisions that you make? See, Simeon understood. Simeon was promised that he would see the Lord's Messiah. Do you think it made a difference in his daily life? So if God promised you, you will see the Lord return to the earth. Would it change how you live your life? Matthew 24, 42 to 44 says, Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch, 
and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Romans 13, 11 through 14 says, And do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, because your salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, close your, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. I want to make one very serious point, church. And that is that the time for games has passed. Look, you may, we may not know when the Lord ret will return. No one knows when he's going to come back, despite what the websites tell you. But you know, there's one thing you do know. You will die one day. It could be today. could be tomorrow. might not be for 50 years, but one day you will pass. And you will have to stand before God. And I promise you, folks, in that day there will be no excuses. Now look, I'm not trying to minimize any pain that you have experienced in your life. I understand that there are circumstances that do affect you. There are things that people do that inflict pain on you physically, emotionally, and mentally. I'm not trying to minimize that. What I do want you to understand, though, is that the cross was enough. God offers healing if you would be willing to turn from the pain and turn to God. The cross was enough. Whatever you've suffered, whatever you've gone through, the cross is enough. That's why there won't be any excuses on that day. You will have no excuse when you stand before the one who gave his life for you. You see the nail, the nail scars in his hands and in his feet and the spear scar in his side. You will understand that everything he did for you was sufficient. And now the question is, what are you going to hold on to? You're going to hold on to that pain? You're going to hold on to those memories? Or are you going to turn to God and let him heal you? Bow your heads, church. As we, as we come to the day where we celebrate the day that the Savior of the world came into into our lives, into this world. He stepped out of heaven and stepped into a mortal body in order to provide a perfect sacrifice for us. I want to know, is there anybody here or watching me on Facebook who is ready to give their lives over to him for the very first time? Like I said, whatever you've gone through, whatever pain you've experienced, Jesus is enough. The cross was enough. You can be healed. You can be saved. You can come home. So if you're watching me on Facebook or you're in this building, just raise your hand, symbolically raise your hand, just letting God know I'm ready to, to come home. For the rest of us, those of us who do serve the Lord, I want you to think right now and reach out to God. God has promised to guide you. God has promised that he will be found by you. So reach out to him right now and ask him, what is it? that I need to be doing here, God, because the time really is short. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Dear God, I thank you for your people. Dear God, I thank you for the, for the people that you have chosen to, to bring your word and, and to love and to be your representative in this world. So I thank you for them, dear God, and I pray, Lord, as they reach out to you right now, that you will be found by them as you have promised in your word and that you will guide us now as we are coming to the end of this pandemic and hopefully very soon and, and, and we start to get back to some semblance of normal. Let us not get back to the normal that ignores your word, dear God. Let us not get back to the normal that spends time on everything except with you, dear God. Let us get, let's, let us get to a normal that includes you as first in our lives, dear God. And if there's anyone watching or in this building who is reaching out to you right now for the first time for salvation, dear God, save their souls. 
as you have as you have promised in your word, if we confess our sins, you will forgive our sins. Forgive their sins right now. Bring them home, dear God, as you brought me home 23 years ago. Now, thank you, dear God. Bless us now as we go in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church. <laughs>